Hey guys, it's good to see all of you. Let's let's pray. Father Almighty, thank you uh, for today, for giving us another day to live, another day to worship you, another day to engage. Jesus, we um, come before you today as very human people, um, people who are broken, people whose minds are in different places, people who are excited to be here, people who are just trying to hold it together in their brain and just hoping that they can make it to tomorrow. Um, we come here today, people who may not even completely believe or are even sure uh, if you're real, but we're here. So Jesus, we ask that you would honor our seeking of you and our presence and our worship of you and that you would find us um, and that you would heal us and that you would direct us and that you would speak to us. Holy Spirit, we ask um, as you work out our salvation in us, that in the places where we are afraid, the places where we do not have courage uh, to believe what's true, uh, the places where we are struggling to have compassion, um, that you would come on us and give us those things, that you would empower us uh, to see past um, all the mess into the truth and hold tight to that. And I ask that in your holy name. Amen. So we are in Advent, um, which kind of lines up with the village's fallow month, and you heard kind of what that was. But Advent is... Basically, a few Sundays before Christmas where we begin to reflect on the birth of Jesus. Um, and it kind of means arrival. So we're, we're waiting on the arrival of Jesus. And Rod told us last week that the arrival already happened. So we're not necessarily waiting for Jesus' birth. We're celebrating Jesus' birth. And we are waiting for the final arrival. When Jesus comes not in a manger, but when Jesus comes on a horse. When he comes ready to make all things new and right. That's what Christmas and, and Advent kind of brings us to as we reflect on the birth of Jesus. Now, tonight or today or whatever it is, because I'm still confused with these services, um, what I want you to hear and think about and kind of connect to Advent is that Advent is about what you have seen and what you have heard. That Advent is the, the whole time of reflecting on Christmas and the birth of Jesus is reflecting on what you have seen and what you have heard and, and why the village even kind of goes into this idea of fallow month, meaning we all slow down. We kind of try to let our life uh, rest a little in this crazy moment in our culture is because it's easy to forget what we've seen and heard because the world is pretty dark and the world is pretty broken. And it gets, it gets kind of distracting. And if it's not just the big wide world that's dark and broken, it's our relationships with one another, what's happening in our family, the choices we've made, the, the craziness of our in-laws. Like there's all this stuff to kind of distract us from what we've seen and heard. And, and just, I, I kind of gather a list of maybe some things that kind of illustrate for us how dark and broken things are, and how distracting they are, and I kind of want to get you into that, so I'm going to try to depress you for a moment, okay? Um, so first, if you didn't know, our deserts are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually, if you live long enough, which none of you will, we will be a desert. And part of that reason is, is that we are in this major deforestation, right? And, and, and so we are using more resources and destroying things that we shouldn't be destroying, and so it just in an, in an environmental sense, that's kind of dark and broken and scary, right? But maybe um, that's not that scary to you because you have cactus in your front yard and you feel good about things because you already live in a desert. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but this was kind of a disturbing thing I discovered this week was that since 2000, 150,000 Mexicans have died under the hands of the cartel. It's just disturbing. Because our world is dark and broken, and I'm working at depressing you, I'm sorry. It, but it is. Like, we live in this world. Um, I don't know how many of you guys know about blood farms, but in India and in Asia, people are kidnapped, put on farms, and their blood is taken and then sold on the black market. Because um, our world is really broken. 
right? It's, it's messed up. But maybe, um, <laughs> maybe on a lighter side, you know all those comments you read on Amazon and all the things you read on the political websites? Those people were mostly paid to put those comments on there. There wasn't one of you concerned citizens. Like you, it's like for every 10, one of you is going, yes, I'm concerned, or yes, I bought this product and I really like it, right? Mostly, you know, we just have a bunch of internet shields, right? That's what that guy is. I, I don't think they wear masks, so when they're doing that. Um, yeah, they wear ties. That's what we're supposed to do. But if you haven't, just one last one, if you haven't, you already know this one, you've been, if you watch the news at all, you know that our world, in all areas, is under this very big refugee problem. And part of it is just we have wars everywhere and violence everywhere and people are being displaced, right? Our world is dark and broken. And sometimes what happens is, one, you and I forget where Jesus even shows up in any of that, and two, uh, we think that our time is the worst time. But in the first century, you heard the story read, and if you've ever gone to church during Christmas, you've heard Luke 2. If you grew up in the church, your father or mother or some relative read Luke 2 every single year, and so you know it by heart, um, or you think you do. Um, but it opens with a couple characters. The first character it opens up with is Caesar Augustus, right? Caesar Augustus shows up on the scene in Luke 2. Now, his name is Octavian, and he was this general. He defart, def, well, he didn't defart anybody, but you know, he may have done that. But he defeated Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, and he was a great general of sorts. Um, but what he's really known for is that he brought peace to the Roman world. You know, Pax Romana. Augustus means the illustrious one. He was called the Prince of Peace. Um, he oversaw, by the end, like 50,000 miles of Roman roads. And he connected the world, or helped connect the world, and kind of brought peace to that. And the way he did that was put Roman soldiers all over these roads. So people didn't get, you know, kidnapped or robbed or anything like that. And he put garrisons in cities. So the peace was not a peace where you and I agree, like, hey, we're at peace. No, it, the peace was because there's a whole bunch of Roman soldiers in your city and a whole bunch of Roman soldiers on your road, and they'll be asking you to carry their equipment for a mile, right? Um, and you're happy to do that because they're bringing peace. But that peace is not a peace that feels good inside. It's an unsettled peace. And if you think you know, Caesar Augustus was that great, then go read history. He eliminated his rivals. He was manipulative. He wasn't that great of a guy. He wasn't a great guy to live under. Um, but he does this census thing. He wants to count all the people. And the other ruler is actually Cyrenius, if you read the King James, Quirinius, if you read the NIV. But uh, however you say his name, he was the typical uh, governor that all of us dislike. He switched sides to get ahead. He won victories that he claimed were great, but they were just out on the outskirts. He divorced his wives when it wasn't working out for him, and they were trying to, he said, poison him. Um, and he got to the place because he was about him. The place he was at, it was about him. And we all know what it's like to be ruled by people who are more about them than about us. Right? And, and this is the state of things. And so they're taking a census. And the reason you take a census is for two things. One, you want to tax people so you can pay for the Roman roads. And two, you want to find out how many men you can conscript into your military. Um, now, here's an interesting thing. It says that all the people were to go to their hometown, right? To the place of origin, basically. That was not what the Romans did. You see, the Jews were like, no, 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 we don't count. Because we know what happens to you when you count. God gets mad when you start saying, this is how much strength and power. So the Jews probably worked out, the Jewish rulers worked out a deal, which was like, okay, we'll take a census if you can let us go back and be able to say, well, we have this many people in the tribe of Judah, and we have this many people here. And so there was probably some kind of agreement happening there. We're not sure, but most likely because Hebrew people do not want to be counted. Um, that was what happened. So what happens is, in this story, is that Joseph and Mary show up, right? And it says that they have to go to the town of David. So we have Caesar Augustus, we have Cyrenius, but there's this other guy 
King David. Now, King David's this ancient king, and he's the one that it's the one that God chose, not the one the people chose. He's the first king of Israel that God chose. And the Messiah, the one who's supposed to save everybody, he's supposed to come through David. Guess what? He hasn't shown up. So if you're a Jewish person, you're living under you know, Roman peace around a governor who's self-serving with a legend who hasn't served up what he's supposed to serve up, right? And you live, if in, you live in the first century, you live in a century of mud, poop, dirt, multiple languages, violence, and a short life expectancy, right? This is your life unless you're close to Rome, and this is where Mary and Joseph appear on the scene. And it says that they had to go up from Nazareth down to Bethlehem, or up to Bethlehem. How, down to Bethlehem, right? Up, no, they went, they went from Nazareth up to Bethlehem, right? But the map says they went down. The reason that is, is that Bethlehem is up, Nazareth is down. But the interesting thing about all of this is it's about 80 to 100 miles, nine-month pregnant woman on a donkey, takes about a week and a half to get where they were going, maybe two weeks. Because the average first century guy probably goes about 20 miles a day. But with a pregnant wife, who, might, who knows how many miles a day they were going. So, and it's not a safe trip. And it's interesting because the Jewish people had this particular prophecy in their kind of back pocket. They knew that David's descendant was supposed to come from this particular town, and what's cool about this prophecy in Micah 5.2 in the Old Testament is that Jesus had no control over this in, sense, in his human sense. He was not in his mother's stomach in Nazareth, you know, like kicking, like we got to go down to Bethlehem. Actually, the circumstances of Caesar and Cyrenius and a, and a census forced them to Bethlehem nine months pregnant because they had to register in the town of David, Right? So it says, but you, Bethlehem, and I never can say this, but this is the location, a path, rough, uh, something like that. Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So Mary and Joseph make this long journey in the mud and in the dirt and they end up in Bethlehem, and it says that there is no room for them in the inn. And as a little kid, because I grew up in the church, my experience of this was, because I lived back in the day when you didn't have a phone app, when you were headed into town and you forgot to like, you know, get a hotel, you could see all the cheapest prices. You just drove around the town looking at the vacancy, no vacancy sign. Right? So when I was thinking of this, is the, there they are on the donkey going from, you know, Motel 6 to Motel 8 to Best Western, looking for the no vacancy, and it just says, or vacancy, it just says no vacancy, no vacancy. Well, Bethlehem is at best a Quick Mart, an Ace Hardware, and one inn. Right? That's, that's all that it is. It is this tiny little backwater town of no repute, has no real importance, But that's where Joseph has to go. That's where Mary has to go. And there's no room in the inn. Well, the reason there's no room in the inn is it's just what they call a caravansary. It's where all the caravans stop. And it's a huge, big rectangle with a bunch of little huts all the way around. And you would rent a hut. So when they were saying there's no room in the inn, there's no room in a hut, right, that circles things. So... Mary and Joseph end up in the middle because this is where all the animals are. Right? This is why we get the animals in the story is that they're all in the middle to keep away from the robbers and the animals and you have all the people on the outside, animals in the middle. Right? And it says in the text that it came time for the baby to be born. Right? Jesus shows up in the scene not in a cave like probably Justin Martyr says that he did, but yeah, I, didn't, I don't think he showed up in a cave. He didn't show up in the back you know, alley. He showed up in the middle of a hotel where everybody was watching with all the camels and the donkeys and poor Mary's having a baby. Jesus shows up very publicly, actually, with everybody watching, most likely. And everything going crazy and all these animals. Jesus appears on the scene. And it says that they put him in a manger. 
And I just want to ruin what you think a manger is. Because a manger is not a wood thing with little hay and a glow that comes off of it and a Jesus. <laughs> no, it's this stone thing that probably had, animals had been eating at and eating at, and they stuck Jesus in it, right? That's how this story happens. But here's the God of the universe becomes a little tiny baby in a little stone trough and changes history. And so no matter what you think about Jesus, if he's God or not, what you can't deny is that the world is different because of what happened in this story. We, what love is completely changed because of this man. What you understood what love was. Self-sacrifice as love was not a concept before this happened. Things change because this baby appears. So when I sat down to write this sermon, I wrote this little sentence, or long sentence, convoluted sentence, and I could not get this sentence to reduce. And so I thought I'd read it to you because I think as you listen to the story, what we're about to hear is what you and I are called to, what the shepherds and Mary and the angels do, or what you and I are called to during Christmas as we remember Jesus' birth and look forward to his coming. So, it's a mouthful, but Christmas is an invitation to treasure the gift of God's Son and ponder his plan to save the world through his Son by glorifying and praising God through the proclamation of what you have seen and heard. I want to play out this, what you have seen and heard, through the story of the angels and Mary and the shepherds. So the baby's born, the baby's born very publicly, and the angels show up. Now, what's interesting about the angels is that they show up to the shepherds, and it says the shepherds were really afraid. And, you know, we see, if you've been in church a long time, every pastor has to say this, when angels show up, people get afraid. Angels have to say, do not be afraid. But here's how it works. Have you ever had a child who, like, starts crying, and then they can't stop crying? So they're like, <laughs> right, that kind of thing. And you're like, okay. Take a deep breath. It's okay. It's okay. Well, that's exactly what the text is saying when it says, do not be afraid. It's this continual, it's okay. Shh, shh, be quiet. It's all right. We're not going to destroy you. Like, we're, it's good. Just because when an angel shows up, you know, people say, oh, they're big. What happens is glory comes. And when glory is, is often described just as light, it's just so intense that all you can do is sort of lose your breath. So the angels are like, it's okay, it's okay. Guess what? We have good news that's going to bring great joy. Right? We have good news that bring great joy, and it's the text says it's for everyone. This is a little revolutionary too. He's telling the shepherds that it's not just for the Israelites. What's about to be said is for everybody, which is good for you and me. It's for all of us. Right? So the angels show up to the shepherds. Now, if you know anything about shepherds, one, they're dirty and annoying. But on top of that, shepherds are considered to be unclean because they have to stay with the sheep all the time, meaning they can't witness in a, they can't be a witness in a, you know, any kind of court proceeding. They can't go to temple other than to deliver the sheep. Um, and they can't have any friends really who are not shepherds because then those friends would be constantly going through purification processes. So if you marry a shepherd, you get an extra burden. You're saying, okay, I'm going to be unclean for the rest of my life. Like I'm going to be shunned. So the angels show up and make a birth announcement. I don't know if there's an old uh, medieval tradition where the relatives and friends of someone who had a baby on the night that the child was born would go around and sing at all the friends and other relatives who hadn't heard yet house. they just go there and they would announce by singing, so-and-so had a baby, which is maybe something we should start, right? We should just travel around and come up with a song for that child and sing and announce that the child has come. Well, this is what happens here. This is a birth announcement, right? This is the, the modern day, or the ancient stork that sits in front of, I don't know if you guys have seen those, like, People put storks in front of their house. And, no, never mind. Um, okay. Well, what they say is that this baby has been born, and the baby is going to be the Savior, Messiah, and Lord. 
which are all kind of contrasting in some ways the kings and governors and ancient kings' provision. So for Augustus, I mean, he was the prince of peace and savior of the world. People referred to him like that all the time. And yet everybody knew what his salvation would bring. Messiah is the word that we you know, translate into Greeks where we get Christ or king, right? And governors tend to be kings. And what he, so, so in some ways, what the angels are saying is all these human people are not going to do what this little baby is going to do because this baby is going to save you. This baby is the king. And guess what? The miracle part of it is he's God. He's the Lord. That's, that's the big announcement. And then all of a sudden, a whole bunch of other angels show up. And they say, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men whom his favor rests. But actually, the better translation is that peace to men on whom God changes or forces his transformation. Like, that God is coming in Christ to push a change into people's lives. Like a new kind of peace that isn't coming from the Romans. Uh, Not an uneasy peace, but a deep, full-bodied peace. Now, here's an interesting thing. You all imagine those angels singing. They were not singing, probably. It says they were saying. They came in like an army. I just watched The Outlaw King. I don't know if you're on Netflix. Has anybody watched this? About Robert the Bruce? Oh my gosh, it's amazing. You should watch it. It's got a little bit of nudity, but the nice thing about Netflix is you can go tick, 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 click right on by it. And all the violence. So I watched like half an hour of the show. But anyway, <laughs> it's an amazing, amazing show. And, and there is this, this chanting in battle because these angels didn't just show up. I think they fought to get here to make an announcement. Now, the interesting thing about angels and singing, and I just, I want to, I'm on a little rabbit trail. I wasn't going to do this. It was not in any notes, but I'm going to talk about it for a minute. Is that angels probably don't sing right now, right? Because if you go into Job and you look, when creation happens and the stars go up, I think it's in Job 30, like the angels sing, right? But then you don't see anything in the Bible about them singing until Revelation 5, when John is caught up. And he's like, who can open the scroll? He's caught up in the heavens and he's in a vision. He says, who can open the scroll? Like, there's nobody worthy to open the scroll. And eventually it talks about Jesus being the one who's worthy to open the scroll, to remove the curse. And then the angels and the 24 like rule, human rulers sing. So angels can't sing till the curse is lifted. Now, you know, I'm, I'm an amateur theologian, but here's my argument. That's my argument, that they can't sing until the curse is lifted. But guess who can sing? Us. We get to sing because the curse has at some level been lifted because we've been marked by the Holy Spirit. So when the church sings, the angels marvel. This is part of why they marvel, is that you and I get to do what those angels could not, is that we begin to proclaim the victory. They're still in the war, right? We we got to get to proclaim what is to come. We have a Savior, a Messiah, and a Lord. Now, Mary and the shepherds, two things happen. Number one, Mary, she's just kind of drinking all this in. In fact, probably Luke got to sit with her because he has some very unique things to say about this. And so he knows that she treasured and pondered it because she was telling him the stories and he was writing them down. But what does it really mean to treasure something? Well, to treasure something is to protect it in her heart. So, so what the text is telling you and I and inviting us to do is to take Jesus' story and to protect it in our heart. To protect something is to, to allow it to stay fresh. And to, when you treasure something, you kind of spend time with it. You let it, the details kind of come out. And when you ponder it, you begin to think about the implications of it, right? So part of what you and I are called to do is to treasure what we have seen and what we have heard, both in our scripture and in what Christ has done in our life. And then we're called to follow the shepherds who dashed into the town 
unclean, and made a ruckus. Started yelling, went in. I mean, maybe they just ran around Quick Mart and Ace Hardware because there wasn't a lot there in the inn, and they're just yelling a lot. And, but however it works, they saw the baby, and they saw the baby in swaddling clothes. Small detail for those of you new moms. In ancient times, people thought that their kids' arms would grow crooked and their legs would grow crooked in the first few weeks. So they would wrap them in a cloth and then they would swaddle them really tight like this. So all the babies for the first week were like that so that their arms and legs would grow straight. That's how that works. And so that's why the swaddling, you know, there's Jesus. He's not, <laughs> he's not with a little cap kind of snuggled like this. They saw him like, hey guys, like that was it. But they were so excited that they went back glorifying, which means making much of, talking about, and praising, pointing to. So really, they're just like, everything that they saw and heard, you're like, could you see that angel? He like waited and didn't kill us. Like, and we saw the baby. And like, they're, they're talking about what they've seen and what they've heard. Which means that the invitation from the shepherds and from Mary is for you and I to do that. So part of it is, is this. It's reflecting on the details and the intricacies of the birth of Jesus and what that has done in our life. That's important. But the second part is that Jesus has appeared in your life. You have seen and heard him. Now, sometimes, most of the time, it doesn't involve a gigantic angel telling you to go somewhere. Some of you have had those experiences. But Jesus still shows up, and he shows up usually in his community. He shows up in his nature. He shows up in his scripture. So I thought I'd give you an example of how he shown up in my life and what it looks like for me to nurture that, and then I'm going to have some time, and I would love to just reflect, one, on the birth of Jesus together, and two, on maybe what Jesus is doing and done. Like, let's glorify and praise God for a little bit as a community and talk about that. So let me talk about what happened to me that I have been pondering, if I can get it to work here. I'll stick it up here. I know most of you won't be able to see this, but it's important because it's how awesome I am right here. Um, so in Pilgrim Group, which is our men and women Bible studies and kind of accountability groups and all that kind of stuff, last week, I think it was, or a week after, before that, I don't remember which week it was. Um, it had to be last week. Was it last week, Kevin? Two weeks ago, we had an affirmation. Like, so it was a, uh, what do you call it, a, a night of affirmation. So we went around person by person. And they looked at you and they said, this is how you've impacted me and this is what God is doing in your life. And then Kevin wrote all the key words down because he was in our group because there were long sentences. And so what people said to me were very powerful things like I'm kind-hearted, spirit-filled, present, non-threatening, excellent counselor, honest, I have courage. I mean, we can go down. I'm pretty awesome. Um, but, (laughs) But the thing about all of that is that each one of those things, I actually know I'm not pretty awesome. Like, none of that happens without Jesus in my life. None of it. And, and what was, it was so humbling to me, because my usual thought is that it's my brokenness and my sin that hurts and affects people, not the things that are good about me. And what people were saying was, despite you sometimes, and a lot of times because of what God has done in your life because of you, you have done something great in my life. You have offered us good things. Well, I, this is something I treasure. I put it on the back of my door in my bedroom. And, and I, I have reflect not just on, oh, it's cool that people think I'm honest, but for those of you who've known and been around me for 17 years, you know my, I'm not always honest. In fact, it's something I've always struggled with is honesty. Not just the honesty about myself and my emotions in life, but just general things I like to exaggerate because I like being funny or making a point or winning. Like being honest is not necessarily something I always have in me. And yet people experience that. Well, I know God has worked that in my life and I've seen how that's happened and I treasure that and I ponder that and I think about how God may create even a more honest person out of me. Because God showed up in my life in all of those places, and continues to show up. And that's proof that he is showing up, right? Which makes me super excited to reflect on what Christ did in his birth because he made it possible for me to even 
be here in this process. So that's one way you can ponder and treasure things is listen to what your community has to say and treasure how God has transformed you. So I think I have a handheld mic and mic runners. What I'd like to do is invite you to one, if you have any questions about the birth of Christ and what we've talked about in this passage, I'd love to answer those or you just want to reflect on it yourself. And if you just want to say, hey, this is what God has done. Go for it. I had an experience this week at work on Wednesday. Um, I was listening to some old music that has been in my life for a while, and it's music that's grown tired, and I'm like, it's I'm weary of listening to it. Uh, and it's secular music, and so I was like, it was a new experience to listen to these songs, which I really like, and go, oh, man, like, my spirit, this doesn't sit right with me. And so I felt the Lord saying, well, sing a new song. Like, why don't you play different music? I said, okay. So I went back to my desk, and I started playing village music, which I sometimes do. And um, the song Meditation on Light came on, which is a song I really like. Um, Anyway, so during this song about light, meditation on light, I'm sitting there in my office, and the room gets, like, a lot brighter. Like, there was more light that got brought into the room, I don't know where, from, in an instant. And I thought, okay, that's weird. And I chalked it up to my own psychology. I said, okay, well, you're listening to a song about light, so you decided to see more light in the room. Um, And then it happened again, like a minute later in the song, just like visibly the light that was there became more vivid. And so I asked, I said, okay, well, this is weird. So I asked the person next to me, I said, hey, did you, did the room just get brighter? She's like, yeah, the room just got filled with light out of nowhere. And I was like, okay, yeah. Um, so I don't know what, what all that means other than that I feel like the Lord showed up in, in a really cool way. That's cool. Anybody else? Anything you want to say? Questions? Thoughts? So follow month is actually a new concept for me. Um, And coincidentally, so my finals ended like the last day of November. So I've had like a couple days kind of rest so far. And um, it is so cool because I have discovered that throughout the year and even throughout my life, I've been so focused on like the future, like getting that degree and like um, getting that promotion and um, getting those straight A's and like not being satisfied with the process. And um, I was actually watching Netflix yesterday and I found myself watching my favorite TV show and like fast forwarding to see how it ends and then like watching the show. (laughs) (laughs) And um, the Lord like even in that moment spoke to me and was like, you notice you are not satisfied with the process. You have to know how it ends. And then it like ruins the process for you. Hmm. Instead of just focusing on me in the moment and just being present. So that was really cool. Wow. That is really cool. Thank you. I really like what you, the the sentence you put up about what Christmas is. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the difference between um, Christmas and Easter. They're both interesting seasons, and um, yesterday Lauren and I were talking a lot about what how we can make Advent a more meaningful time in terms of l- anticipating and looking forward to to Christ, but, but then we're also doing that during Lent. Mm -hmm. So what, what's the, I mean, or should there be a difference? I don't know, but. Well, I mean, if we think about it from a church calendar perspective, Advent and Lent have two similar things that they have fasting, but in Advent, like you were really not, you're not fasting as a reflection of, you know, Jesus and his temptation through the desert and 
um, on what you need to, to confess and repent of, you're actually fasting in preparation so you can eat a lot for a big birthday. <laughs> like, so it is, a, it's a fast to prepare for a party. And so it's preparing yourself to really celebrate what happened. And, and, and so, whereas Lent, and in fact, Lent is actually a baptismal time. So usually people get baptized on Easter, and during Lent, the whole community is fasting actually to pray for the people who are getting baptized and are being catechized during the Lenten process. So even in the church calendar, they have two very different kind of structures. Julie and then Corey. So a few weeks ago, I sat in the healing chair, and Kevin and Rod prayed for me that I would be able to sit still, or be still, and then I was, like, deathly ill for three <laughs> three weeks. <laughs> I'm not yeah. having them pray for me. <laughs> so just remember, be careful what you pray for in the, in the healing chair. Um, but it, it's been interesting, like, because I... I'm symptom free. Thank you for everyone who prayed for me. And I'm, but I feel so rested and like emotionally and mentally and spiritually. And I don't know, it just feels like it's, it was an answer to prayer, even though it wasn't my pick. <laughs> and, um, and just that God does things through difficulty and and that that's a part of the like recognition of of like I mean both the birth of Jesus and the death of Jesus in some ways are like a recognition that of helplessness and and so that the transformation God brings so anyway that's kind of what I've seen and heard lately cool Corey so I don't know exactly how to ask this question um, I guess my question is, um, how do we wait for God to return with like a celebration anticipation? Like if suddenly we're without the privilege of being able to do that. Like I'm thinking of the victims of the blood farms and the refugees the people who are being separate, separated from their families, yeah. people who are victims of systemic and governmental corruption. Yeah. You know, I can't imagine being mid-transfusion on a blood farm and being invited to this. Right. Well, there was an ancient father of our church named Rod, he told me a story a long time ago that, that was that very helpful for me in thinking through some of this. Um, and that he had, a, and I'll butcher the story because it's been a long time. But he had a friend that he was having lunch with, and they were talking about somebody who had to go and um, be on a ventilator for, you know, four or five hours a day. And the guy was saying, I think Rod was saying, um, I'm going to butcher your story, but that's okay. Uh, Rob was saying, I can't imagine doing that. And the other person said, well, that's not what God's asked you to do. Like, that's not your burden. Like, and, and, and I think in thinking about that, it's hard for me to put myself in that place and say, how could it be possible to even praise God or refocus or proclaim what I've seen and heard in that position? Because um, I can't actually put myself in that position. And and so I think what I would re what I rest on is that the hope of Jesus for us who are in the comfortable chairs at the moment, though we all have some dark stories that we're wrestling with, um, is the same hope that mid transfusion the person is is that that they will be restored even in this moment of terror, God will make things new and they will be healed. And, and what's interesting is, I mean, Paul goes through all of these situations. And the thing about Paul is that he thinks that when he heads into a city, when he's around people, that he is a herald of a victory that has not yet come. And he believes when he proclaims that victory that the Holy Spirit explodes around him and into people's lives and does things that he has no control over. Um, and so I think whatever the proclaiming of the gospel is for that person in that moment, 
will transform. I don't even imagine to be able to go beyond that, I think. So. That's the best answer. I have time for one more comment. Anybody else have any thoughts? Rod, do you want? In my defense. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, I know I butchered this story. <laughs> no, no. Uh, praying over Julie um, and that story reminded me that um, I really believe in love to pray. I believe in prayer and its effect, and I love praying. And I often doubt that prayers on my behalf will happen. Like, um, I'm going to go ahead and have the surgery. My neck isn't going to get fixed. It's going to be problematic. But... Um, I've been suffering from tennis elbow, which is odd because I'm not athletic. Um, <laughs> but but it's been horribly painful, and I lost grip strength, and I couldn't do stuff with my left hand, and um, it, it was just annoying. And a few uh, weeks ago, um, well, month and a half, um, uh, Misty and Samantha um, were talking to me, and they offered to pray over me, and... Um, and the next morning, my elbow was much worse, and it was really painful. And I thought, oh, see, that's how it works. And then um, I don't get the joy of that kind of healing. And then a week later, I noticed the swelling had gone down. And a couple of weeks later, I would have, and right now, it doesn't hurt at all. And, and I have my grip strength back. So there's something really great about how even when we think, we're, when we're not following on what we asked God for, <laughs> God is, and he, to my great joy, has made my elbow feel really, really good. That's, that's awesome. Um, so, yeah. Um, and I, too, I, I do struggle with... Um, the power of prayer and the way in which God answers. I think we often think that God will give us what we long for, but usually it's in our suffering and our pain that we find intimacy with God. So I think that the person at the blood farm maybe knows God in ways we can't imagine. I realize that because I spend a lot of time with suffering people, um, because I do love to pray for people who are hurting and they are closer to God most often than I can ever be. Thank you. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much uh, for this community and for the way that they are open to your spirit working. I just ask that you would bless our time as we sing and bless the food to our bodies. And I ask that in your holy name. Amen.